It's a flame-emulating solar light. Nothing particularly new about that, but what is new is the way they've implemented the LEDs for the flame effect inside. It's a different configuration from normal, and it looks pretty good. Let me uh, turn the light off. Well, I'll change the lighting settings so you can see this properly, and then you can see what it looks like in real life. So the first thing you notice is it's a kind of wider light at the base and it's a reasonably accurate, it's not going for that usual stripe of LEDs that surges up the way. The pattern is fairly repetitive, but there is variation. It's quite complex working out what they're doing here, but there is a distinct uh, intensity rhythm. You can see it at the bottom here, just ramping up and down, but the alternation of the other LEDs is different. Okay, I'll bring back the light, so watch your eyes and then we can open it and I uh, can explore it. One moment, please. The light is back. Let's open it up and reveal the oddity inside. So instead of going for the usual stripe of LEDs, let me zoom down on this so you can see it better. They've actually got a very crude flame shape of LEDs. And when I enable this, it seems like the pair at the bottom light together, the pair above them light together, and then the one at the top is independent. So pretty much three channel. Uh, the LEDs are emulated identically on the other side. And because they mount this diagonally in here, it does provide fairly good illumination. In, let me just try and slip this back in and cover it. It does provide fairly good illumination from all the sides. I noticed that when I experimentally turned the circuit board round so that it was facing directly out one side, it produced a very dark shadow down the middle. So they're deliberately hiding that shadow of the circuit board on one of the corners. It's quite neat. Okay. It's time to open it up. Where is the screwdriver? Phil's screwdriver with a Phillips bit. The solar panel, incidentally, is 33 millimeter square or roughly an inch and a quarter. It's a fairly decent sort of panel. I could turn this off. So I shall take the other screw out. This is where I really should actually upgrade to a high-speed screw whipper outerer mechanic style, like South Main Auto and uh, other channels. So it's using a AAA nickel metal hydride cell, rated 600 milliamp power. Not much else in the back other than the switch. Uh, and that then heads all out to the circuit board. And initially I can see a little inductor, probably a boost chip, a diode for rectification capacitor. On the other side I can see another capacitor. They're just in parallel. The chip and then the LEDs, but no resistors. I guess it's just relying on the fact that that little inductor limits the current. Okay, I shall whip the connections off the circuit board and we can reverse engineer it. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore the circuitry. I shall zoom down in this so we can see the circuit better. Uh, this solar panel, despite just being 33 millimeters or inch and a quarter square, when held up to one of these 20 watt LED floodlights, generated 125 milliamps of current. That's very impressive. While well, seeing it's got a 600 milliamp hour nickel metal hydride cell, that's a good output. That would only happen in direct sunlight. Well, actually, in direct sunlight, it might, might even be higher. The circuit board has the two sides. The LEDs are copied on either side. With uh, There are five distinct circuits. Even though the D and E at the bottom here and the B and C seem to light together, they are wired separately to a pin of the microcontroller here. And I guess that's just because, um, although they may well just be lighting together, it just means that there's more current available to LEDs when you've only got two in parallel each time. Um, the boost circuit... And the charge control circuit is a fairly standard little chip. Got deja vu with this because it was very similar to another uh, flickering effect light I took a look at. It's probably from the same factory. So it uses the little uh, solar control chip, an inductor, a shot key diode, and then a capacitor to generate the DC voltage required for this microcontroller. The microcontroller also on the other side has a little capacitor as well. Just belt and brace, I suppose. You'd have thought one would do. But they've got two. It makes sense. There's no harm in having a couple of capacitors. Um, I think at this point, really, we've seen the configuration LEDs, how they're wired in parallel pairs on either side, and how there's five circuits in the microcontroller. We've seen the, the 
charge and boost control circuit with its inductor here. Let's go straight to the schematic. It makes more sense. I shall zoom down a little bit more. So the charge control chip is called capital A, small a, small t, capital L, capital B. And the solar panel is connected from the positive of the chip to the input to that. The negative is connected to the input. And it charges the nickel metal hydride cell when the switch is closed. If you have the switch off, it won't charge during the day. It, it won't, presumably it's to prevent overcharging. But uh, when the switch is closed, that's the wee switch that will probably give problems that you could possibly just put a blob of soda over and coincidentally get a dab of Vaseline or silicone grease and put it on these contacts here. Maybe even spray the circuit board with, uh, or paint it with nail varnish just to protect it. It's these things, you know, it just protects these lights from uh, moisture damage. But um, the nickel metal hydride cell is charged from the solar panel via this chip because it's got a little diode inside. And it also uses that to sense dusk. When it detects the low-level output, it switches on the circuitry inside that starts pulsing this inductor. And it does. these units do send to, tend to detect when the nickel metal hydride cells dropped at one, about 1 volts and then they'll stop pulsing because they know it's fully discharged. Uh, when it pulses, this end is positive, it pulls it down negative. And when it does that, it creates a... A magnetic field in that direction. When the magnet it turns off and the magnetic field collapses, this end goes positive, this end goes negative, it adds to the voltage of the cell and pushes through this uh, short key diode and charges this capacitor. And it keeps doing that at very high frequency, providing a DC voltage here, which uh, is fed to the microcontroller and also to the positive of all the LEDs. The LEDs are then switched down to the negative, no resistors, it's relying on the impedance of the Outputs of the microcontroller, and that just lights the LEDs, and then the rest is done in software. It's very straightforward, but it's actually pretty good. I do feel that they could have used a bit more randomization in here just for variety. Even with the just the seemingly three channels, it's still not too bad. Um, in my own version of this in the past, because the more LEDs that light up, the dimmer the other channel goes. I've just uh, experimentally just connected the two bottom LEDs straight across the supply rail or enabled them in software continually just to, so they were just lit but they would fluctuate up and down as the other LEDs lit and then after that it's really just getting a an effect that you maybe ramp or just flash this one this layer up and down and then the tip one just basically occasionally sweep up every so often it's a very simple pattern and um, that randomizer could add a lot to that but there we have it the little uh, flick of flame solar garden light, you know, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, and this one came from Pound Stretcher in the UK, but I'd guess they'd be found elsewhere. Uh, the usual thing is just a straight line of LEDs, but this little uh, fat uh, flame shape of LEDs actually makes a difference. It's quite a good result.